Very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you can hear me well. Mm. While we are facing some technical difficulties, we would like you to log in to firstly, Mentimeter. We will be running some interactive polls along the way. So for now, please feel free to participate. Kindly log in to www.menti.com with the code 858492. For, the, for people who are here, for the participants that are here, kindly post your questions on the Q&A session and you can even up, upvote your question your questions and comments on the questions that you feel are relevant towards you. If your question is specific to any panelists, please do mention their name in the question as well. Now, as we are waiting for some technical issues, let's start with some votes. Log on to www.menti.com and use the code 858492 to start voting. So for today's seminar, we are actually looking at whether the US dollar is the dominant reserve currency. So we have 77 of you participating in this question right now. We have 177 participants right now. So please do feel free to go into menti.com and use the code 858492 to tell us what do you think is the biggest driver of a potential shift away from the US dollar as the dominant global reserve currency. Thank you so much for participating. We are honored to have with us today with our expert panelists as they navigate us through these issues in the age of pandemic and beyond. Chairing today's session will be Dr. Prakash Kanan, Managing Director, Chief Economist and Head of Total Portfolio Management, GIC. Dr. Kanan is also a council member of ESS. Without further ado, Dr. Kanan, please. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the uh, third installation of a uh, webinar series by the Economic Society of Singapore. Uh, so today we are tackling uh, the very interesting and globally relevant question of will the US dollar continue to be the dominant reserve currency? Uh, now, you know, regardless of which dimension of an international currency you look at, uh, whether it's the use as an invoicing currency, the denomination of foreign reserve holdings, or even the denomination of foreign currency debt, uh, the US dollar reigns supreme. Uh, with its market share ranging you know, anywhere from 60 to 90%, depending on the market. Uh, but there is a sense that, that things are changing at the margin. Uh, so policy in the US is becoming a little less predictable. Uh, the international role of the dollar is being used as a tool uh, of foreign policy in some cases. Uh, you can see it was one of the options here uh, uh, on the chart. Uh, and at the same time, 
uh, you know, you also have the rise of, uh, of some credible alternatives. Uh, so the euro seems to be uh, get, getting its house uh, in order. Uh, and obviously, no one can deny uh, the rise of, uh, of China. Uh, and we also have to entertain the possibility uh, that it may not actually be a sovereign issuer uh, that ends up replacing the dollar. Uh, you now have a suite of cryptocurrencies, stable coins, digital currencies uh, that could all potentially uh, supplant the dollar. Uh, so hence, this question of whether the dollar will continue to be the dominant reserve currency uh, is very timely. Uh, and we are very fortunate today uh, to be joined by three excellent panelists uh, who will all share their views uh, uh, on this topic. Uh, I'm going to introduce them in the order in which uh, they will be speaking. Uh, so first up is uh, Jameis Lim. Uh, he's an associate professor of economics uh, at the Essex Business School, uh, as well as a current member of uh, parliament representing the constituency of Senkang. Uh, previously, he was uh, the chief economist of the Third Rock Group, uh, an investment management group, uh, a lead economist uh, at the Abu Dhabi Investment uh, Authority, uh, and a senior economist with the World Bank. Uh, James's research interests covers uh, international microfinance as well as uh, political and uh, developmental economics. Uh, following that, we will have uh, David Lee, who is a professor at the Singapore University of Social Sciences as well as the uh, Shanghai University of Finance and Economics. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor at uh, NUS uh, and a council member of the British uh, Blockchain Association. Uh, professor David is a prolific author and he has published books on uh, artificial intelligence, blockchain uh, and other emerging uh, technology. Uh, he's been a very early thinker and researcher uh, on uh, blockchain and crypto projects. Uh, and he's also a co-founder of the Blockchain Association of Singapore uh, and the Libai Academy. Uh, last but not least, uh, we also have Song Sen Woon, uh, who is currently with uh, the private banking arm of uh, CIMB. Uh, and he's previously been with uh, Merrill Lynch, Warburg Dillon Reed, as well as ABN Emerald. Uh, Sen Woon has a wealth of experience in studying financial markets uh, in the ASEAN region uh, and uh, is a familiar face uh, in uh, Southeast Asia's uh, news media and talks uh, really broadly about uh, some of the more relevant issues uh, for the region. Uh, so the way we're going to run this session uh, is as follows. Uh, each speaker is going to get uh, roughly 10 to 15 minutes uh, to make some opening remarks. Uh, and then we will uh, open up uh, to Q&A for about uh, 30 minutes after that. Uh, we've had one survey question. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, launch another one right now, which is uh, a little simpler, uh, which is uh, which currency do you think will take the most market share away from the US dollar uh, as a reserve currency over the next 10 years? Uh, so we've got uh, Euro is one of the choice. The other one is the Chinese renminbi. Uh, the third, as I mentioned, is actually uh, 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 potentially a cryptocurrency. Uh, and then the fourth is, uh, is none of the above. You know, basically that um, uh, despite all uh, the faults of the U.S., uh, it's going to retain its, uh, its market share. Well, it looks like the... Uh, the battle between uh, the, the U.S. And, and, and China is uh, is also playing out uh, amongst our audience uh, uh, at the moment. Um, interesting. So so it looks like it's reached uh, some kind of uh, of steady state, uh, and at least uh, uh, at this point uh, in the conversation, uh, the audience uh, uh, have the view that um, you know the most likely successor, uh, if you will, for the dollar. Uh, is actually going to be the uh, uh, the Chinese uh, renminbi. Um, very well. Uh, I'm going to uh, introduce uh, uh, Jameis right now. Uh, so Jameis, uh, why don't you you kick us off and then um, uh, share your your thoughts? Great. Thank you, Prakash. So I will go ahead and share my screen. Alrighty. So. Um, Though I, I, I'm the scheduled to be the first to share today, uh, in part because I think um, I'm offering a little bit of a theoretical background and, and a very general take on the matter before we dive into much more uh, specific issues that you'll see uh, the others bring forward. But uh, so let me go ahead and start by um, you know this is something that 
uh, first, it's useful to, to draw a distinction between uh, the common use of the word reserve currency by um, most observers, including market observers, is just this notion that you have a currency that um, would be the predominant currency in the world, right? But of course, we, uh, if you think back on your introductory, and so I'm putting on my educator hat here, if you think back on your introductory economics, you know that money has um, three main uses, a store of value, the medium, medium of exchange, and a unit of account. And for each of these, there are both private as well as public uses, right? So what you'll see listed there on the screen, uh, the, the private use is the first one, and then uh, behind the slash is the public use. And if you just look at this, you'll notice that the reserve currency only serves one purpose, which is uh, a store of value for uh, public actors. But obviously when we think about a reserve currency, we think more broadly in terms of uh, a currency, a predominant currency in terms of whether it is a private or public medium of exchange. Uh, so you see there, for instance, it can be a vehicle currency with which um, international transactions between private agents, uh, you know, firms or, or banks can occur, or it can be an invention currency, which is uh, the medium by which, the, the main mechanism by which central banks uh, may potentially try to defend their currency vis-a-vis. -vis. You know, same for the unit of account, you know, you have an invoicing currency, which would be the way that private actors, usually traders and, 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 and uh, international banks would invoice uh, accounts and then in, in contrast the public use of that would be the anchor currency which is the way that central banks would peg their specific currency so what I'm going to do uh, next is I'm going to go ahead and um, show you a sequence of you know again very somewhat anecdotal uh, evidence but based on data for each of these areas both uh, public and private to the extent that I was able to to gather some of this evidence, right? So if you look here in, in this first slide, what you'll see on the left panel is just this notion that uh, the dollar, just pure, the, now, now we're looking at the reserve currency use, right? So this is data, these are data from COFR, it's the IMF's um, official reported uh, data on, on, on reserve usage. And you see, obviously, overwhelmingly, uh, the, the pie chart is in dark blue. Incidentally, this is, this is probably one of the few areas where academics can respectably use a pie chart. Uh, in most other instances, it will be deemed too simple, but I think it, it conveys a significant amount of information to see that the dollar basically is still two thirds in terms of uh, allocated reserve currencies worldwide, right? And if you look at the evolution of this over time, actually it hasn't changed by that much. Um, in particular, you see the dollar, while it has eroded a little bit in terms of its use, as an official reserve currency, uh, none of the other claims have really uh, emerged or already come to challenge the position of the dollar. And, and although uh, most of the participants earlier on talked about the renminbi, in fact, it is the euro uh, that is the secondary uh, reserve currency for, uh, of, for the official sector worldwide. Now, if you cast your eye on the right panel, instead, what, what you'll see is um, an allocation in this case, a very specific instance uh, of assets into China. And why this is interesting is because you'll see, obviously, for both allocations in stocks or bonds, um, that the private capital cross-border flows into these assets has really increased. Um, but if you just look at that, um, if you just look at that chart without looking at the vertical axis, you'll be very impressed. But then if you look at the vertical axis, you'll realize that all this is still a very small fraction uh, of GDP, right? It's 4% uh, of GDP. So uh, even in terms of allocations into one of the, the contending currencies, uh, the private sector has not allocated that much. Now, there are institutional uh, reasons behind this, and we, we may get into that in the Q&A, but nevertheless, is that uh, the renminbi is still not uh, a large private sector uh, asset currency. Now, if you turn to the role of dollar uh, as a medium of exchange versus the others, you'll see that on the left panel, what you have is uh, central bank swap lines. And, and what these are, are the use of swap lines in the most recent um, 
you know, a pandemic crisis, right? And you'll see, of course, that uh, overwhelmingly uh, the use of swap lines with uh, the Federal Reserve uh, is, it, well, or rather the, 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 the application for swap lines with the Federal Reserve is still dominant. And what this suggests to us is that um, ultimately uh, when you have a crisis, at least as of as recently as uh, 2020, um, it is still the case that people run to the dollar as uh, as a medium of as as a medium of exchange for the purposes of ensuring uh, adequate liquidity. If you uh, look on the right panel of this, uh, what what I've shown there is um, the cross currency basis. So the cross currency basis, I, I won't get into the te the technicalities, but uh, it is when you look at that the. Um, what this is, is an indication of uh, the extent in which um, private sector participants in financial markets are looking for liquidity in, in, in various currencies. And, and these are all uh, the three, three alternative currencies vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. And the fact that it is negative uh, suggests that a lot of um, the there's still a what, what's sometimes called a dollar squeeze, a, a desire for more uh, dollar assets rather than, uh, excuse me, a, a desire for more dollar liquidity rather than liquidity of other forms. And finally, if you look at th these are data from um, the Bank for International Settlements, it looks at credit uh, for emerging markets. Um, and if you look at this, you'll notice that uh, overwhelmingly, again, is the dollar that uh, dominates this uh, denomination of um, of instruments in terms of international borrowing by emerging market economies. So um, whether it's bank loans or debt securities, it's still the dollar. And what this uh, suggests to us once again is that um, to the extent that emerging markets still suffer from some degree of original sin, the inability to borrow in their own respective currencies. Uh, when they issue in, a in one of the other international currencies, it tends to be uh, in the dollar. Now, finally, in terms of uh, the dollar as a medium of exchange, uh, it's still pretty much unparalleled, right? So if you look at, um, uh, if you look at, Oh, excuse me. So this, so this should the, the headline shouldn't say a medium of exchange. Uh, what what it sh should say is um, th that third uh, uh, element here, which is the unit of account. So um, in terms of a, of the dollar as a unit of account, you'll see that uh, while it is the case that the petrol yen, yuan, so uh, the denomination of purchases by the Chinese state for uh, petroleum products uh, has um, increasingly been denominated in renminbi. Uh, by and large, um, it is still the case that uh, as a payments currency, as a global payments currency, um, you still see that the renminbi is far behind that of the dollar. And while, while what you see here in terms of, so these are uh, transactions data from SWIFT, which is uh, an international a payment system, right? And what you'll see is that essentially uh, it's still the case that the dollar dominates there. And then finally, if you look on the right side uh, in terms of a unit of count for pegs, um, while it is true that uh, it is, you know, the dollar is not completely dominant in terms of what is being, what uh, currencies are being pegged to it. Uh, and in particular, you'll see a reasonably strong showing uh, by the euro as an official peg currency uh, is still the case that the dollar, so shades of orange, uh, is still uh, distributed all over the world um, and, and it's still very much um, an anchor currency, in, in, importantly even for the renminbi basket. So the renminbi basket is comprised of a sequence of currencies, but I think many of the market observers who look at this quite carefully uh, immediately recognize that it is the dollar that drives most of the dynamics of uh, the day-to-day -day renminbi movements. Okay, so um, now all that said, it sounds like we are, um, I, I've made a very strong case for why the dollar should remain uh, the predominant currency, but Here's uh, the caveat, an, an important one, and that is that re reserve currency uh, switches uh, can actually be quite sharp and sudden. So these are two 
it, it, it was a project uh, led by Barry Icon Green with, with various co-authors. And on, on the left panel, what you'll see is what happened uh, when, when he looked at uh, the composition of reserves in the immediate aftermath of the, the, the Second World War. What we recall is that, of course, um, uh, excuse me, this is the immediate aftermath of the First World War. Uh, which ended in 1918. Um, so, so what you 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 recall, uh, if you think back on history, is that at that time, on economic history, if you think back at, to that time, uh, the great the British pound was still uh, the uh, dominant reserve currency at that time, and you can see that in terms of um, the sterling. So the 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 um, blue bars over there. Uh, but what you'll see is that very quickly, the dollar, which is in red, uh, came into prominence in the aftermath of this. There, there are that, you know, economic historians recognize reasons for this uh, rise in the dollar and the, the, the retreat of this, the, the sterling, right? A big part of it is the stubborn insistence uh, during the interwar period of, uh, of the British authorities to go back to the pre-war peg. But nevertheless, Setting aside these reasons, it's still the case that um, you see a fairly sharp switch in the rise of the prominence of the contending currency, which is the dollar. And this becomes even more prominent if you look at uh, what happened uh, in, in terms of the switch after uh, among the Commonwealth, uh, after you exclude the Commonwealth countries. And if you look at uh, the composition of global foreign public debt, uh, you can see that basically the switch occurred really sharply uh, and, and it occurred right after the First World War. And then that continued to consolidate such that uh, by the time the Second World War uh, rolled round, the dollar was already the predominant currency. So again, just correct all this. Uh, I meant uh, the First World War, not the Second World War here. Okay, so given that caveat, what then uh, do we think might be um, important supporting fundamentals for how this switch might occur. Recall at the time uh, that was the switch from the pound sterling to the dollar. A big part of that was driven by the retreat of the British economy relative to the US one. And where might you see this retreat here? Well, uh, these are projections that I did with my previous shop, but essentially uh, what I want you to focus on is just the fact that in terms of economic size, uh, emerging countries are in various shades of orange and then developed markets are in various shades of blue. But uh, essentially you'll see that until recently emerging markets um, were really just about a quarter of global output. But by 2030, uh, even when you measure, measure this in terms of, a, of dollars, so not, not in terms of purchasing power parity, but just in terms of uh, real dollars, you'll see that um, advanced economies will only uh, account for about half. And the big difference is what you see, the DRA dragon. So these are the, the greater China economy. So Taiwan, Hong Kong, and, and, and China itself. And essentially, um, these economies will be so dominant, so, so much larger as a share of the global economy um, that it becomes kind of inevitable when you think about just pure size, uh, thinking about the quantity equation, right? So the quantity equation for those of us that uh, have forgotten, again, undergraduate uh, econ, it is the idea that um, the, the nominal value of output is going to be equal to the velocity of money multiplied um, by, um, by the amount of the money supply. And what the, the intuition behind that is that uh, as long as your economy is going to be large, you might expect uh, more and more of your currency to be circulating, uh, of course, within your domestic economy, but increasingly as an international currency as well. So what would this trigger uh, for this shift potentially be? Well, if you think back, one driver of the Roman Empire uh, collapse was actually currency de debasement uh, because of overextension to finance wars. Remember, I, I qualified that by saying that there's a Roman Empire. Of course, we know that of a very more, a much more recent empire that does exactly the same thing: overextension to finance uh, wars. And and what you'll see here is that, uh, and these are projections from the Congressional Budget Office, uh, the projected debt stock for the U.S. Uh, into 2050 is going to be large and rising. And this is a comparable kind of debt expansion that does not bode well to the extent that there's going to be monetization of this debt into the future. 
And might we be in the midst of this? Hard to tell, but uh, I'll just uh, re remind uh, everyone that's here that uh, the dollar tends to move according to regime shifts. Um, what, what that means is that every, you know, X number of years, you, you see the sharp change in the movement of the dollar in one direction versus another. We saw that, um, so, so th this was uh, definite, this is definitely the case. It characterizes the, the movement of the dollar historically over a long time period. And more recently, the weakness of the dollar uh, may be portending something uh, like this in the future. So I'm gonna, I think I've run over, so I'll stop my remarks there. Thanks, Jameis, uh, uh, for those uh, uh, comments. Um, I've I've one question in mind uh, that I'll that I'll just um, uh, leave it with you, uh, and then when we come back to the Q and A at the end, uh, you can think about it. Which is, um, you know, you've looked at this issue of uh, an international currency, um, you know, very well through through an economic lens, uh, but there's a big kind of geopolitical uh, uh, angle to to all of this that that's mm -hmm. happening. Uh, so maybe when we when we come back to the Q and A, uh, we're very interesting to hear your thoughts about how that geopolitical tension uh, is likely to play out in the uh, in the currency space. Uh, but now I'd like to go to uh, 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 David Lee. Um, David, uh, you have uh, 15 minutes. Uh, if you could um, uh, share your thoughts with us. Oh, David, I, I think you're you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash. I think uh, hopefully you can see my slide that I've just uh, presented there. And I think I'm giving away that there's a decline in the US dollar as a reserve currency. And I'm going to talk about the new programmable money uh, that we have. So uh, I think uh, Jameis has given a very good um, overview. And we can see that in terms of uh, US dominance in currency trading is about 44.1%. 40, in terms of reserves in the central bank is about 61%. But in terms of payments, is about 38.9 um, and euro comes in in a second. Okay, so it's impossible to sell the US Treasury without appreciating the currency of the creditor. And also that is hard to have a stable payment system. You have a bottleneck. And of course you will affect a lot of other issues that we see from there. So the question really you have to ask is can we have a new payment system that is separated from the USD currency? And meantime, we all know that Japan in the last few years is experimenting with cryptocurrency as a legal payment system. So Japan has already started the ball rolling. And this is what um, Herbert Hoover, the president uh, of the United States in 1933, he said, we have go because we cannot trust the governments. Coming from the government, this is very interesting. Um, and you can see that currency is all about trust. And that trust costs a lot. And we know that uh, Go is one, one way to look at how trust it is. So normally we talk about in G we trust, right? We look at the coin here in, in, 18, uh, in 1864, they already minted as in God we trust. That G stands for God. And after the first and second world war, we know that they have um, the US dollar has been using the Go as a backing. Before that, every country was using it, but uh, from 1944 to 19, 1973, um, US has become the world reserve currency. And after that, we can see from 1973, go is not backing it. And it's from in God we trust to in go we trust. And then it's now in government we trust. And you can see the change in terms of money is always driven by technology. And in 1990, there is a company called DigiCash founded by David Chum, he started a centralized cryptocurrency. And in 1996 to 2009, um, a lot of people started with, e, uh, started with Ego, which is a centralized gold back currency founded by oncologist Douglas um, you know, Jackson. But we all know that no one and nothing are allowed to replace the US dollar as a medium of exchange, a store of value or unit account. So we go through this process of paper, money, plastic, cards, you know, trying money, what is next? And that's interesting, right? So where are we going? And you see, the question is that will a software and the fractional reserves quantitative easing system that we are talking about? I think that is important to know because we now have a new technology better than electronic money, which is 
decentralized. It has no legal entity that government can close it down. There's no known person behind. It's just a software program, how to close that software protocol down. That is the key question that the governments are asking. And they're moving from in government we trust to in C we trust. And that C stands for corporate. And we know that during that period from 1973, all the way we have the trusted third party and the trusted third party, all the licensed financial institutions. And it's a very high cost trust that we have. The question is that, is there an, an alternative? Can we move from the digital centralized economy with all the digital money to a different form of uh, technology and a form that's based on cryptography and the community? And that could be lowering the cost of trust by trusting the cryptography and the community. And this is how Bitcoin and Ethereum is, is trying to do, where everyone is a bank, where everyone is an exchange that we don't need any more bank and we don't need any exchange. And this is where P2P pay payments come in. The question is how do we do price discovery when you have peer-to-peer -peer transaction? So the key question here is, okay, let me go back here, is to trust the community and then now we have this cryptography and community, but you add on um, corporate, then we have the stable coin, which we are, we are now familiar with. But we take away the corporate, we shall have the so-called decentralized finance. We do not need any centralized, um, you know, corporates or whatever. And you can see all the names there like Compound, Uniswap, SushiSwap. You just have to Google them. You understand what I'm trying to say. But the thing is that if you look at the market capitalization, it's more like kids play. Real estate account for 228 trillion, but crypto is only 337 billion. It's just kids play. Well, that's what we thought until Facebook came out with Libra coin. That wakes every government up and say that, hey, this is not really kids play. So governments have to act before they lose sovereignty because Libra can reach 4 billion people out of 7 billion in the world and they can bypass the fiat currency even though it's backed by a basket of currency. So therefore, there's, there was a fear of missing out by government and all the research coming in for central bank digital currency. And in China, it's open. Mu uh, Changchun has said that, which is the head of the Digital Research uh, Institute. He said there's a fear of competitive payment system, meaning Libra name was not being said. But China differentiate between currency and payment. So they came out with DCEP, which is a form of CBDC, and they separated the function of issuance and payment. And this is the first move that China has done. Never has anyone done that before. And they have another um, company called BSN. And this is um, it's a rate date. It's a rate date company uh, supported by Beijing and a lot of government. It's a public-private uh, partnership. It's a blockchain-based service network that will be very interesting. We'll talk about a bit later. So there's challenge from the decentralized finance but the government ultimate motive is to have a decentralized butter system. Back to where Keynes, John Mana Keynes, talk about Banco. So what is the characteristics and features of CBDC? It allows offline transaction. Even though it's digital, even you are not on 5G, even you are not on, on internet, you still can transact using CBDC. And more general value transfer via e-wallet without a bank central bank talking about without a bank and without going through a clearinghouse and more accurate representation of accurate activities, collecting data of digital economy, war of challenge of non-fiat e-money, reduce the cost of printing and also destroying money, maintaining privacy protection and the ability to manage anonymity where you need to. So you can transact without letting government know the data, but you can transact big amount that the government wants to know as well. So it allowed for digital or smart contracts and also stimulate growth in the underserved sector. So these are all the benefits of CBDC that I've given there, but I don't have time. Main thing is to lower the cost of trust. And more importantly, the government is taking back the control and each government strengthening, strengthening its self sovereignty, not the sovereignty of the US dollar, away from the SWIFT payment system, which is US based so that they can do peer to peer payments with their citizens and globally without going to the SWIFT payment system, which is US centric. So it was not a trade war that we all thought it is, but a different kind of war they were talking about. 
DCP-EP is a new type of digital currency and also a new part of pay payment system that facilitate offline payments. It's the first central bank uh, digital currency that will be launched in a big way before Olympics next year. It's in has international reach. It's built on Bitcoin and spend transaction uh, output technology, a separate currency issuance, issuance from payment and it's cryptography preventing counterfeiting and an AI data center, they collect data when they need to. And all the countries started to join in this party. And I think there has been talk about collaboration between Singapore and also Hong Kong in the project Ubin and Lion Rock. And the significance of TCP is that you will replace conventional money, the use of cash and checks is beginning to drop drastically. And the two tier system of DCEP, first tier, the government issue, second tier, free for all, free competition. You can use blockchain, you can use anything that you like. You can be McDonald's, you can be, um, you know, coffee bean, you, you can join in. So that is the beauty of DCEP that will then have all the corporates in the world using DCEP without the government intervention. Remember, the innovation of Satoshi Nakamoto in Bitcoin is that the, no government can stop it. And now government is using it to cross border. So the potential for decentralized butter trade is the ultimate. And this is about cross-chain uh, of inter interoperability. What do you mean by cross-chain? That means that there will be a lot of blockchain, not just one. Many blockchains talking to each other and every blockchain is a node. And this is what BSN is about. Okay, BSN is going to be the standardized blockchain China is going to stand, set the standard for blockchain. It's open source, it's decentralized application, and 100 cities will be using it, of which eight cities are outside China, and Singapore is named one of them. So this will be a combination of private blockchain, public blockchain, IoT, AI, a convergence of technology that give rise to a new interoperable global payment system. So it has nothing to do with currency, but purely payment because everything is tokenized. So how about adding DeFi, decentralized finance? How about looking at what's the problem now? The problem is that we have privacy invasion in the virtual world. Well, we have private crypto asset that solved the problem. Now we have decentralized network peer to peer, therefore it solved the problem of Singapore or attack or hacking and security issue. We can wrap crypto to make it safe, safe and volatile. We can have equitable distribution of wealth, which is what the government problem is about. So to make sure that there's no rent seeking, it's going to be a, little, a lot more inclusive than a current exclusive system where 50% of people do not have a bank account. So this is what is DeFi is still young. It's only 10 billion, but DeFi means that it's a blanket term for financial services like borrowing, lending, and trading built using decentralized infrastructure such as public blockchain and smart contracts. Okay, what is really DeFi to governments? Well, government used to be, the, the central bank used to be a lender of last resort, no more. It is the liquidity provider of the last resort, which means that price discovery is the major problem for peer-to-peer -peer transaction. How do you know the price? Well, you have a pool. The government will supply the e-currency or the token. The suppliers of goods will, will supply, will put into the pool. When you're in the pool, the buyers just have to purchase and it will done autonomously. It doesn't have to match the buyer and seller because there's a fixed formula that will automatically done because of this pooling effect. So as long as one and two is uh, satisfied, we bypass price discovery because there's a formula, we bypass market makers. Everything of value in this world is just a token swap. And that was the idea of John Maynard Keynes in the Second World War, an era of traceability, transparent and frictional trading and the supply chain and logistic will happen. And this is exactly what Singapore is doing. There's a lot of less need for a reserve currency. Central bank refocuses on just providing a secure public digital infrastructure by issuing currency and not worry about using that as a weapon or anything else. So in both community and government, this is what we do. We trust both, right? So the DCEP and BSN is a private blockchain and the BSN is a public blockchain. The intersection is an interoperable and the government will harness the DeFi tech, which is what they're trying to do to have the tokenized world. And the token economy is better than the digital economy because it is sharing of wealth, not just sharing of services. So in unison with social objectives and tech convergence, we have a revolution. 
and only a revolution can dethrone the incumbents. So we have digitalization, which is centralized. We always talk about digital economy. That is not enough. We are talking about a decentralized digitization, which is tokenization, right? Then we have convergence of technology and objective, social objective, and the fundamental reimaging of the way the banking system engaged the public with A, B, C, D, okay, E is environmental friendly technology, F, and G, and Q. So we have all this AI and so on. And the final destination is decentralized butter economy that we're talking about. So, well, these are all the challenges, cryptocurrency, stable coins, central bank, digital currency, but there is even more. Even the allies are breaking rank. They have the in INSTEX, which is the instrument in support of trade exchanges, short form INTEX bypasses uh, the sanction and they are from one, I mean, the, all the um, Europe big countries, they are they're all backed by them. And then the successful transaction is to bypass sanction by the US. So we are moving from fractional reserve system back to the full reserve system. You can see from a negative interest rate. You give the money to the bank and say, I do not want it because I'm not going to create money. I'm going to give it back to you. And the central bank says, I'm going to charge you interest for that. We are moving back to full reserves banking system. Now, the real driving force in the quantitative easing infinity, which is a, everybody is saying that it's, it's irresponsible fiscal uh, uh, monetary policy that we have. And we are the impending crisis, government, all the government need help. And there's a convergence of technology and social objectives. Now, solidarity means that there's no dominating or manipulating relationship. And this is what the world need and all the governments know that. And there's also a subsidiary, subsidiarity, subsidiarity idea, okay? And it's assigned to the smallest possible group that can perform it. That means you do not have too much of the centralized, centralized power, you distribute the power. And there's a universal destination of goods driven by technology. Every person has the right to what is virtually and, and vitally necessary. And this must not be withheld from, from anyone, right? This is an ideal. So what is it to the rescue? Well, distributed ledger, distributed ledger technology and crypto governance is exactly what will drive this the QE infinity world uh, away from this impending crisis. So in a G0 world, what happens next? In the short term, system maturity. The fractional reserve system, the peak has reached and the change in investment strategy in the sense that this is the end of the US-centric non-tech, high margin, oil and gas based, top of the pyramid type of investment that we do. And the midterm is achieving a true financial inclusion, uh, achieving unison, where a singularity of sustainability and inclusion, and in the long term, the coexistence of government currencies, CBDC, and decentralized butter, where everyone can tokenize any, anything of value. Even people in Myanmar can to tokenize a coin and sell 10% of the coin and exchange anything with you because they're all tokenized. Just a swap of token, a year of token swap with stable coins. And it, it is not DCEP. It will be a token currency P2P payment. So it's TCPP instead of DCEP. So to conclude, the Chinese social and tokenization butter initiatives will change the entire global landscape to one without the need of a reserve currency. So thank you. That was my presentation. I'll pass it back to Prakash. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, David. Uh, lots of interesting uh, uh, ideas there. Uh, I think, um, you know, if, if I was a banker, uh, I think I would be losing a lot of sleep uh, just uh, listening to your presentation because um, you know it looks as if the 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 role of banks uh, is likely to very much be disintermediated uh, uh, through all uh, all the, the different channels that you're saying um, I'll get back to you again on, on the Q&A but maybe maybe the one um, uh, question just to, to leave in your mind is uh, you know you still have the government very much involved uh, I think in in those things if you were to think about um, the purely private alternatives, um, is there room for for more than one uh, of these solutions, uh, or will you know will we be moving around with a um, you know a digital wallet of like twenty uh, uh, different uh, uh, currencies, uh, or 
uh, you know, is that is kind of network effects all just going to push towards uh, uh, towards one? So maybe we will come back to that um, in the um, uh, in the uh, in the Q and A. Uh, but now I'd like to move on to uh, uh, our third uh, panelist, uh, uh, Song Sen Won. Um, you know, we we um, we were going to have another uh, polling question, but I think we'll we'll bring it back um, uh, at the end. Um, and I think the the important uh, uh, aspect here is really about um, you know we're talking about all these global issues, but what does it mean for the region? Uh, what does it mean for for Singapore? Uh, and I think uh, uh, Singapore is well placed to uh, to guide us on those uh, on those questions. Thank you, Prakash. I won't take too long. Uh, be, well, running short, a bit of time, uh, and also because James David, I think, has come through with uh, at least I think solid presentation in terms of why the dollar still dominates. It's still the currency of trade, reserve currency, all these commodities are priced uh, in, in dollar, dollar rules. But obviously, if the US is any other country, uh, given the fundamentals in terms of uh, debt to GDP, et cetera, uh, we would have certainly have seen the dollar come un under a lot more pressure than what it currently is. So the question here is, how long can we continue to trust the US dollar? So far, well, nothing else. I mean, uh, David has a, a, a good example of where we think we can put trust in, uh, in the future. Technology now allows that. Interesting at the start, we've got you know, a respondent saying, renminbi will be out there as a possible reserve currency. You know, we must bear in mind, and China just opened its economy, what? Um, over four decades uh, ago, it's race ahead. I, mean, I remember the day when I first went to China, you bring currency, it's almost impossible to find any money changer uh, in China way to change. Uh, but somehow we scramble around. Nowadays, you go to China, you need WeChat, uh, et cetera, uh, as well. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to move around or transact. You know, this, the, the, the credit card, uh, part of the, uh, I suppose, money trail uh, in just one quick jump. Could we see that jump, digital side? I think David certainly has pointed out in terms of uh, where China and, and, you know, and uh, I suppose, friends uh, are associated in terms of business, both private and, and, and public side, are doing uh, more to try to de-dollarize. Uh, how quickly we can de-dollarize? Very interesting. I, I suppose, again, is at this point, you don't really have anything else to trust. I mean, we can look back at the, the latest uh, episode of uh, Credit Crunch immediately uh, in, what was it, February, March, everybody raced to restore, reiterate, resign swap lines with the US Central Bank just uh, to ensure they have access to US dollar, to ensure small functioning of financial market or banking system. So that just reinforces, I suppose, the need currently now of dollar, uh, and it probably will still hang around for a little while. You know, the, the question earlier on whether the 10 years will it still be there. I suspect it will still be, but obviously much really will depend on how other countries uh, will de-dollarize. Again, coming back to the region, if you look at Russia, China, you know, the, the, the US dollar share of the total trade, if I look at the latest data up to, I think, one Q of the year, first time, I think it actually dropped below 50. I think in the first quarter, US dollar portion is 46%. Uh, it, and their respective currency has, has grown up. But we only see this bilateral type of exchange, whether it's China with Malaysia, China with Indonesia, on a very small scale. But it is happening. So what else can they trust in to see that happening? Um, perhaps it will be a case of somebody brave enough to say and, and look at the US government and say, okay, your credit rating has to be downgraded again because of your fiscal position, which is going to deteriorate sharply uh, in the coming couple of years. Will that accelerate the, 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 excuse me, the dollarization uh, process? I suppose it will, but again, is what do you then trust in? Good question. Um, uh, to, I think government everywhere uh, continue to ask that uh, as well. But for now, pricing in dollar 
access to uh, US dollars still remains the dominant theme. What does that mean closer to home uh, for all of us? I suppose again is if we come back again, you know, uh, uh, the US dollar portion of reserve still the main chunk, regional currencies, very, very small. Uh, I suppose what we can see again is how quickly ASEAN as a region can embrace technology, blockchain. If there's one common thing that we can at least agree upon, uh, so as far as the Southeast Asian economies are concerned, is how digitalization, uh, e-commerce, the whole technology, uh, uh, I suppose, ecosystem can benefit anyone. You want, no one's going to be quarrel uh, over borders, over sea borders, etc. as well, or less so, like, or South China Sea, but technology to help them in terms of changing, upgrading, uh, will play a larger role. And perhaps this is where we come in, uh, in, in terms of where Southeast Asia, can we do less uh, or use less of a dollar and more of regional currencies? I think that's happening, but again, it's extremely small, uh, as you can see, but it's rising uh, the, in, in the coming years. But I would still say, perhaps for the next 10 years, dollar will still likely rule uh, the rush, but uh, as the, I suppose, uh, fundamental the US isn't likely to turn around anytime soon, we will be looking to depend less on the dollar. I suppose I'll be looking at things like whether commodities, oil will be still priced in USD uh, for the moment. It still is. So looking for signs of, of, of entities shifting away pricing from US dollar will be, I think, a clue. And the thing again is, what alternative do you have if you don't price your goods and services uh, in dollar? Very little at this point. I would like to, I think, uh, uh, to think that somewhere along the line, what David talked about earlier, leads to a possible solution and alternative that is no longer a case of in US dollar, we trust that. But I think time will still uh, be on the US dollar side uh, over the near medium term. But how quickly China comes up, I think means that alternative are certainly around the corner. It might be a big corner for now, but it's certainly around the corner. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Prakash. Thanks, Arun. Uh, 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 interesting thoughts, uh, uh, as always. Um, um, so the question that I will come back to you uh, a bit later on um, would be a, a, a little bit more um, uh, controversial, uh, because I know you, you like to, to dabble in the controversial questions. Uh, and that will be uh, whether you think uh, this, this uh, uh, a potential change uh, would have any implication for um, the conduct of monetary policy. Uh, in, in Singapore, uh, you know, we are very exchange rate focused, um, you know, is that, is that likely to, uh, uh, to change? Do we have to rethink the basket, et cetera? Uh, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll come back to you on that. Uh, but I'm going to um, uh, move uh, back to uh, uh, Jameis. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of questions on the, on the Q&A uh, channel right now. Uh, which in a way is, is um, uh, uh, mirrors my, my, my initial question to you, which is, um, look, you know, you, you, you have uh, these alternatives. You, you talked about how actually uh, the euro uh, has uh, shares also been growing up. But at the end of the day, uh, it looks like this is going to be uh, at least in the, in the sovereign space, uh, a US versus China uh, uh, issue. Uh, so we have questions here, uh, which, you know, talk about, uh, is it just a question of when as opposed to if? Um, you know, we have um, uh, questions, as I mentioned earlier, about the geopolitical dimension, about countries trying to uh, uh, break away from uh, a dependence on the dollar, if that's going to be a tool of foreign policy. Uh, what, are, what are your thoughts, uh, at least on this kind of G2 uh, problem? Um, so personally, actually, I, I'm much more in favor of uh, thinking of it in terms of regional blocks. And if you start to think in terms of regional blocks, uh, then it, it won't, at least I won't arrive at the conclusion that it is a uh, bipolar, but rather a, it will be much more likely to be a tripolar world. And I mean, again, you think back, I, I structure my thinking in terms of um, regional areas, regional uh, currency areas. And there, if you look at uh, the euro is a sufficiently large market, um, and if this is where I weave in um, the politics that you you had raised. I mean, 
ultimately the euro uh, whether the euro survives or not of course uh, this goes through cycles but um, a lot of it whether the the euro area fragments um, really depends on recognizing the the euro as a political project and that's what the euro is is a political project so as long as we fully recognize that um, there is the political will to ensure the success of the common currency and you know the very fact that they wouldn't even let tiny Greece go uh, a few years ago is I think a testimony of that the strength of that political will and and so that's when where I think uh, we shouldn't discount the euro even though it's not not much used in conversation today because as a region uh, there is a certain persistence there and, and that it comes down to uh, political will, as, as I argue. Now, when it comes to China, um, it, of course, the, the big question that is also a political question, it, it stems from the decision of uh, China in whether it decides to move uh, in the direction away from Bretton Woods too. So Bretton Woods too, for those of us that have been observing this for a while, is just this idea of a core periphery with China being the periphery using exports to the, the US uh, as a, a mechanism, as a driver for development. And to the extent that China has uh, in part accelerated by COVID, but it, even prior to this, made a concerted effort at um, rebalancing its economy toward domestic consumption that creates uh, the conditions i think for a, a large domestic currency area uh, that will only become stronger as china overtakes the us especially in the region going back to theory this is the gravity equation all over again just based on size as well as distance uh, with regional trading partners they will become much and much uh, more and more confident uh, of pricing um, trans international transactions in in renminbi and then finally um, on the dollar um, thinking back on the political economy uh, it, it comes down to two things right one is uh, much derided and that is this idea of um, fiscal discipline and one thing that um, when I say much derided uh, one mechanism by which uh, this um, fiscal discipline has been imposed historically in the US has been through this uh, debt ceiling right and I know that you know there are criticisms of uh, it as a mechanism because it, it it requires an endorsement of something that was already decided on by Congress but nevertheless uh, the the entire theater political theater underlying uh, debt ceiling uh, increases um, serves as an important I think disciplinary device for uh, on the fiscal side and then on the monetary side obviously the question is to what extent extent would the Fed continue to be independent? All indications are that uh, it is, at least with the current uh, regime in place. But then again, it ultimately, um, we know that central bank independence um, can potentially be fleeting. It is a power ultimately delegated by Congress. And so to the extent that um, they start to become a lot, uh, a lot more pliant to uh, the fiscal side and, and reflect fiscal dominance, then that will be, I think, a political impetus for the US uh, to retreat uh, from being a global currency into a much more regional currency. So I think the dollar will always still remain the predominant currency, uh, certainly in, in the Latin American uh, region, but whether it continues to hold its, uh, its, its dominance globally, I, I think uh, maybe not in 10 years, but in 20 or so years, a, a tripolar, uh, global currency, multi-currency system uh, is entirely possible. No, thanks, James. Uh, it was very interesting. And in a way, it uh, links a little bit to the to the question I posed to uh, Singwon earlier on, which is, you know, this part of the world, uh, we've always been thought about as uh, part of the dollar block. Uh, but then going forward, um, actually, we, we could end up just being very much part of, uh, of a renminbi mm -hmm. uh, uh, block. Um, it, um, I'm going to turn now to, uh, to David. Um, David, there's a lot of questions uh, here uh, for you. Uh, I, think, I think they're kind of in, in two categories. I think the first one goes back to the issue of CBDCs. Um, and I think 
uh, CBDCs, uh, there's, there's one uh, thread of questions here, which is basically on the effectiveness. And I think here, uh, if I understand the question correctly, um, they are talking about the concerns that you could potentially have on disintermediation, uh, whereby uh, I don't really want to put money in my bank anymore. Uh, why do I trust it? I'd rather just put my money uh, with, the, with the central bank. Uh, and that behavior... Um, will get exaggerated uh, during times of stress. Uh, so you know, how, how do we, how do we uh, uh, handle that issue uh, when we think about uh, uh, CBDCs? Uh, and then and I'm gonna turn to, to uh, my other question, which I'll ask you, which is, um, you know, that, that there's a plethora of, of um, uh, 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 you know, private solutions uh, out there. Uh, is there room for, for more than one? Uh, and you know, will we, um, you know, end up uh, getting, uh, you know, the, the equivalent of uh, of, uh, of let's say an, an old uh, 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 currency that's no longer valid? Uh, will we end up having some of these legacy digital to, uh, 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 coins uh, in in our e wallets that that are, you know, at some point maybe no one else wants to wants to accept them? Uh, so maybe if you could if you could take those two uh, those two questions. I think I think the first question is extremely important, especially uh, if you are bankers or central banker or you're worried about stability of the entire system. The worst thing that can happen is that because CBDC currently doesn't, everybody is talking that it will not pay any interest, and it's going to be hundred uh, percent full reserve. So I posed the same question to Mu Changchun. Uh, two weeks ago, and I said that what what are your concerns? I think the main thing is that when you when you put your money into the bank, it's a fractional reserve system, and you're subjecting yourself to corporate risk. But while you hold the CBDC in your e wallet, you are only taking on the country risk. So it's one layer risk. So there there will be cases where the when the banks are having a major problem hit by bad debts, like for, for example, we have a financial crisis, all the assets prices all start to come down, and then people will start to withdraw the money from the banking system, and the fractional reserve system, every single dollar you re withdraw, you have to call back nine dollars of loans. So therefore, the question to uh, Mr. Mu then was that, what do you do? And the answer is that they really thought through. There would be a ratio, there's, um, there's there'll be a ratio between the full reserves versus the um, fractional reserve, and they, that ratio is determined by the market condition. So they will control um, how much CBDC can be changed into dig digital currency in the bank. So that will address the worries that the run on the bank or run on the whole banking industry. That is the first thing they need to. Second thing is that they are not paying any interest. So CBDC is treated as a public good rather than you know as, as a money creation where you have to worry about credit lending. So that will reduce the kind of worry the central banker has. I think China has thought through this very carefully. Um, they are really rolling out. So um, I hope that answered the question. Uh, the second question you mentioned is that there'll be so many different coins, um, the, the cryptocurrency, which there's nobody is in charge, right? There is also um, stable coin, which you need to have a third party trust, which is another corporate that will like Facebook or Facebook Association, 100 members who have to worry about how that stable coin is being uh, backed by a uh, basket of currency or assets. So you are taking on corporate risk in that case as well, because you, you not only have to trust the community in the sense like Bitcoin, you have to trust the community plus the corporate, right? And also at the back of the corporate, you are backed by fiat currency, you have to trust the government, right? So three trusts that you have to place. So I think, um, but China has a different thinking. China, you can see that they are used, to me, I'm, as an observer, I'm seeing that BSN will be the most powerful organization in the world. And all these new organizations that come out, they do not have a me attitude. They are always in a community spirit. So even as a company, they will actually diminish themselves to have many, many shareholders. You will see that happening now. And at the end of the day, it is, it is the whole world, to your first question to Jameis, the whole world is about those countries without debt and those countries with debt and those who have and those that do not have, right? Those that will not have bank account, but they may not be very poor, but they are needy. 
So the, the world will be in a very different social fabric and structure. The key question is, how do you serve these people? All the government will be asking, how do I maintain the stability? And it doesn't matter what it is. The government will be agnostic to technology. Government will look at the technology that as long as you help me to maintain the stability in my country, I will use that technology. So government usually will have that. So to answer your question is that it will eventually it will be a token economy that we are going back in time for butter trade. Okay, and we will have a butter trade, but this time it's a digital butter trade that we are talking about. And I think China is leading this charge and a lot of countries, including Singapore, we have the Omnibus Act, which is basically a lot of time you look closely, it's about, to, it's about tokenization. So I pass it back to you. No, thanks, David. Uh, that, that was very useful. I mean, uh, I, I will have uh, uh, one question that I'll, I'll come back to you. I mean, you said that uh, governments uh, like to maintain stability. Uh, but I think one theme that's coming up uh, in the in the Q and A, which I think is a very valid uh, uh, question, is that governments also want to maintain control. Um, and so the challenge there is uh, from everything from uh, monetary policy to um, you know know your customer anti money laundering uh, issues. Uh, how will that uh, be be evolved, or will you kind of get? Um, uh, kind of uh, increase market share by um, your, your kind of private solutions happening only in in kind of call it the the, the, the dark corners of the uh, 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 of the uh, payment system uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you on that question uh, I want to um, jump now to uh, to Singwen. so Singwen, um you know if you can come back to um, to the region uh, again uh, and I think Jameis uh, uh, set it up uh, quite nicely, uh, and in, in fact, we're already kind of seeing it a little bit in the in the dynamics uh, right now. Right, I think the correlation of some of the regional currencies uh, with the renminbi uh, mm. has increased uh, mm. uh, over time. Um, does that does that have any any implications uh, in, in your mind? Uh, you know uh, how we should we should think about uh, uh, monetary policy in, in, in Singapore, is that still the right framework to, uh, uh, to operate under? Uh, yeah, I think it's worth considering. Uh, it will still comes back to the first principle, what's the point uh, of our uh, NER policy? It is again about price stability, it's about us being a small open economy importing everything. Uh, that we consume goods and services. So uh, it should be still about price stability underpinning uh, the fundamental or reflecting the fundamentals at that point uh, in time. So if we are seeing, indeed, we are trading more among ourselves with uh, Asia, Southeast Asia, North Asia, anchored by, by China, then moving forward, we'll suddenly see that the US share of the trade in goods should come down. If we start to look at, uh, you know, well, we will be looking to see how we can depend less on the dollar side or de dollarize. Uh, it's going to be a slow process because the US is still the dominant, uh, well, it's still the largest economy, even though uh, it well, depends how you want to measure it. So, dollar share is still going to be there. Over time, I will still say that. If we are talking about price stability, stable inflation, reflective of growth, the baskets as far as the, the reserve the, and our currency holding will be reflecting that shift perhaps uh, in, in trading uh, partner. It's going to be, I think, a while. As I said earlier, if we have uh, US, uh, sorry, uh, Russia and China are doing more with their own currencies, we are seeing China, Malaysia, and China needs a lot of stuff from the Asian ASEAN region, we just essentially swap currencies. So coming back to Singapore, that swap in which we are coming through Singapore itself can be reflected in that composition of the currency that we hold as well. So it still come back to how do we ensure uh, price stability for you and I here in Singapore, despite uh, how we make all this payment in whichever currency or uh, even a digital one uh, over the coming years. I think it's quite straightforward, although I think the mechanics uh, may change uh, over time. Oh, thanks, Edward. I think that's the, that's the right, uh, uh, right
right framework to think about it. Mm. Um, I'm going to, to turn now to uh, uh, back to Jameis. Um, and, you know, because Jameis, uh, when, when you set things up, you had this question of, uh, at the end of the day, uh, irresponsible policy is, is one of the triggers that, that, that um, uh, ends up dethroning um, uh, reserve currencies. Um, you know, the, even when you saw the poll, I think we had, uh, you know, fiscal policy is, is also kind of scoring uh, highly. Um, I'm going to uh, ask you probably uh, the most uh, d detested question that any uh, academic economist can get, which is, what are your thoughts about MMT? Uh, uh, and so for, for those of you who are, um, are not familiar with that, this is a modern monetary uh, theory. It's a, it's a doctrine by, um, uh, by, uh, by a group of economists, which has got a lot of prominence uh, recently, and it really kind of ties uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy uh, at the hip. Uh, James, what, what are your thoughts about that? You know, do you think it's uh, it's likely to, to to see the light of day? Uh, are we already practicing some forms of it? Uh, and would that be uh, the uh, call it the, the, the tipping point, uh, which which really uh, changes things? So thanks, uh, Prakash. I I think uh, you put your finger on uh, how uncomfortable uh, academic economists would be talking about MMT in part because sometimes uh, it is felt that what MMT offers uh, is a new and what they offer that is new um, doesn't quite work. So uh, the, the part that I think many economists fully recognize uh, even prior to MMT, MMT uh, but um, certainly MMT has brought this to the forefront, is um, the fact that ultimately uh, economic monetary policy and fiscal policy are closely related, right? But again, this is uh, not something that is uh, in any way a surprise to academic economists. It's, it's something that is well understood. Perhaps one contribution that MMT has uh, helped with um, clarifying is just how um, prominent this fiscal dominance can potentially be. But uh, importantly, I, th I and, and this is where I think a lot of academic economists push back, uh, it comes from a very unique position, uh, and if I may, almost a US-centric position, uh, when you have the, the, the benefit of um, issuing some kind of reserve currency. And, and when that is the case, I think, uh, you get uh, quite a bit of leeway that is simply unavailable. And, and this is when, uh, and Prakash, you will fully understand this, having worked at the fund, uh, when, when emerging economies such start to uh, take this doctrine seriously, and we have seen intimations of this, right? I mean, most recently in, in Indonesia. And I think that's when uh, you have to weigh uh, to what extent the, the sheer comfort that you have with uh, theoretical MMT versus what we have seen play out um, time and time again in emerging markets that have uh, tried to exploit um, the, the ability to monetize uh, debt and what that has implied uh, in terms of eroding uh, whatever confidence there is in um, a hard one by now, uh, inflation target. Now, the one thing that I think uh, is a mitigating factor is that we do see inflation, especially in advanced economies, uh, really quiescent all over the world. And to some degree, I think that offers some um, additional space, policy space, with which uh, you can potentially inflate things away. But I think um, it, we would be we want to be very careful about un un anchoring uh, inflation expectations because once that happens, and especially when that happens in emerging markets, uh, then you have a situation where you have the worst of both worlds, having no control of uh, monetary policy as an instrument uh, with which to, uh, to use as stabilization policy while also having to deal with uh, a fiscal crisis at the same time. No, thanks, Jimus. Uh... I guess that's that's why they call it the uh, the magic money tree uh, in some places. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn now to uh, to David. So David, um, uh, you know, the Q and A box is kind of uh, 
lighting up with all the uh, uh, different questions. I, I think I think your presentation has really uh, been been uh, uh, really kind of stimulated a lot of uh, uh, interest in uh, in a range of things. Um, but there is a thread there which I want to bring up, which uh, I mentioned earlier, which is um, the uh, the kind of ability or willingness of governments to give up control. Um, and, you know, whether it's, it's on uh, anti-money laundering, as I said, but also just kind of control of monetary policy more basically. How, how, do, you, how do you think about that? Yeah, two, two responses to that. First is from um, the governance side. So um, I want to point out the four different scenarios. One, when human govern human, that is the law and regulation that we have, right? When um, blockchain govern human behavior, that is a on-chain governance that we have. So that on chain, there's a coding, there's a program to di dictate what human can or cannot do. So there's another scenario. Now, you, if, if you have um, blockchain governing blockchain, then everything is automated. Okay, there's no human involved. But the government would love to have human governing blockchain because off-chain governance is not inconsistent with on-chain uh, decentralization. So a, a government can actually manage that kind of situation of money laundering, corruption, and so on. In fact, that is core managing the anonymity that the China, Chinese is talking about. If you, in your wallet, you transact less than a certain amount of RMB, the government will never have anything uh, record on anything, just like cash, just like you're taking out cash from your pocket. But once you stepwise increase your amount of spending, then the KYC standard will continue to go up and they will have a AI center looking at all these data transaction and pick up the pattern, pattern recognition of money laundering. So in fact, that is one thing that is very important. Secondly, a lot of people are asking, how can China go international? Of course, you can just download a wallet. Anyone can download a wallet. You have Remain P. There's nobody who can stop you from doing anything and you can put in any tokens in there and you can start transacting. So the key thing here is important is that it's only a piece of software. So China is the only country in the world that you have to report to the authority if you are doing any blockchain or decentralized technology project. So there is the information department that all the blockchain project in China are all registered. That's one. Secondly, China also have a new law last year that came out that all cryptography Right. If you use cryptography and you don't use it properly, there's a law that actually dictate what cryptography you can use and what cryptography you cannot use. So China has really thought through this very carefully. They're way ahead of a lot of countries in how to manage and control this possible gold finger that we talk about that a private individual can come and take over the entire network uh, like the James Bond movie and create chaos for the whole world. So I think governments still have a lot of control. And last thing that I want to say before I pass it back to you is that if government and the central bank are doing a good job, then there's no reason to have Bitcoin in the first place. So this is, this is my conclusion. It's because that central bank has a lot of issues that therefore there are communities that need to use this for their own purpose. I think it's important to understand that. I'll pass it back to you. No, oh, thanks, David. I, I feel like uh, we, we need to have uh, an, an entire webinar just uh, just on your on your ideas. Uh, you know, just the the, the thought of a, a blockchain controlling another blockchain. Uh, you know, sounds something out of a out of a science fiction uh, movie. Um, we've got about a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm going to um, uh, give Singun, um, you know, a kind of uh, a, a quick answer question, um, uh, which um, uh, I think he is well placed to, to, to think about. Um, and, you know, we've talked about uh, uh, the dollar, we've talked about renminbi, mm. we've talked about all the uh, um, kind of digital or crypto solutions, stable coins, uh, but we haven't kind of gone back to, uh, to the past uh, and, and talked about gold. Um, you know, is that is this is this the period where uh, where gold can can shine again, and and is that a potential uh, new safe or rather a return of the old uh, safe haven? Well, I suppose if we talk about gold, uh, Yemen talk about the Roman Empire uh, all, all the way back, so it was used and used a medium of exchange, 
I suppose as long as human has this psychological attachment to the glitter stuff um, and put trust in it, I, I think it really all boils down to trust. If we put a trust in something and gold continues to be through the history of mankind, uh, get that attention of trust, I suppose, it still stands uh, to be something which is still worth something between two parties. All you need is you and I say this is worth something and there we go. And that's it already, I suppose, accepting that we can extend to what we talk about in terms of the, the, the crypto side, the digital coin side. It is if we can trust the system, the structure, it is good. Same thing with gold. If you trust it, it will still be there. Um, value swings around. It's pricing US dollars. Uh, it might be in the future pricing, I don't know, one, one tether, but even I think one tether is also one US dollar as well. So we might see where ultimately gold value holds in that new uh, I suppose, environment where uh, it's not price in dollar. I think that's really perhaps a more interesting fun bit to think about. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much. I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice end uh, um, to, the, uh, to the session. Uh, I'd like to, to really uh, uh, thank all the panelists here. Uh, they're really very thoughtful presentations uh, on, a, on a, I think, a, a really uh, a relevant topic, but also a very difficult uh, uh, topic. Uh, you know, some of it involves um, predictions like, you know, 10, 20 years uh, uh, in the future. Uh, and some of it, I think, as, uh, as David would probably attest to, uh, are already with us, uh, uh, some of the solutions already with us uh, uh, right now. Uh, and, you know, as, as Jameis has mentioned, um, you know, we, we've, we've, we've been down this, this journey before, right? It's not as if the dollar has been predominant uh, uh, reserve currency uh, forever, uh, and you know, if if anything in this um, uh, kind of increase, call it G two world, etc. I think his view of a potential multipolar uh, regime, uh, I think, is is not far uh, from uh, from from reality. Uh, and I think Singwin has also helped kind of bring that uh, a lot of that back uh, back home, uh, and what uh, uh, how that uh, uh, impacts uh, the way we we go about things here. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to end with uh, with a plug for um, I believe it's the fourth uh, webinar of the EI, uh, ESS uh, series, uh, and that's going to talk about uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, just for for those of you who who needed a reminder that it's that it's still out there, um, and the title is called "Taking Stock of the COVID-19 Pandemic: Where Do We Go From Here?" Uh, that's going to be a month from now on the 28th of October at 5 p.m. Uh, once again, we've got a great uh, 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 setup of uh, panelists. We've got uh, Dr. Jeremy Lim. Um, we've also got Associate Professor uh, Pua Kai Hong um, and uh, also Professor uh, Tan Kong Yam. Um, and uh, finally, uh, Associate Professor uh, Walter Thesera. Uh, so really kind of a, 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 a star panel uh, uh, in line for that. And that will be chaired by, uh, by Vikram uh, uh, Khanna, uh, who's with the uh, with the Straits Times? Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good evening, and uh, uh, thanks again for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much.